So good. It's so great to see you. Happy New Year. We, yeah, we'll keep saying that. Um, hey, uh, before we're done today, we get to share in uh, one of the ordinances uh, that the Lord has given to us, and it's going to be in the Lord's Supper. So we'll close out the message, and uh, we're going to prepare our hearts for, for that, that time together, okay? Um, you can grab your Bible, because that's what you know, we, we use as the text for this course, because we're going to be talking about the promises of God, okay? Instead of diving into this year, making all the promises to the Lord like we do, and that's a good thing. I mean, I set goals, and we're going to talk about habits, which I think are more important than even goals. Um, one of the things that we often do this time of the year, as Cassie noted, um, is we make resolutions, we make plans and goals, and then, you know, we're not too far into them and we fail and we can't quite keep all of our resolutions. What if, here's the question, what if instead we were to focus on not our promises to God, but the ones he's made to us? Because God always comes through on his promises. And so that's what we're going to do for the next uh, six weeks. We're going to talk about the different Covenants, that's the, the kind of the biblical term, covenants that God has made to his people. We'll talk about the difference between covenants, contracts, um, how God keeps his side of the covenant regardless. And we're going to talk about how that works. There's a mystery in all of that. Um, but we thought it'd be a great thing. Let's just talk about God's promise to us. Uh, as we often say, you know, it's not so much even our love for him, but his love for us that transforms us in the same way promises work like that. And today we're going to look at the Adamic uh, covenant. It's called the covenant he makes to Adam. And it's all the way back in Genesis three. If you want to turn there, we'll get there in just a moment. Everything recalibrates back to Genesis three. All right. So um, honestly, you know, we, we make our resolutions and we, we kind of, kind of don't always, always keep them. Um, and, and what happens is that we, we can get discouraged. But here's what I want to set up this, this whole message with. What if, what if this year was the year um, that even decisions we've made in the past that really continue to beat us down, maybe your worst habits that you continue in, and you think, well, I'm just, that's just kind of who I am. You've kind of given up. Maybe there are things from your past that you think are unredeemable or have impacted your life in such a way. Well, I can't change the past. It'll always be a part of my story, um, which is true. But what if this was the year where all of that, even your worst mistakes, and we all have those things that, that continue, maybe we go back to way uh, more often than we should. What if this was the year where not only you were able to leave that behind, but what if this was the year that all that has happened in your past, God actually redeems in the present and flips it all around for your good and to his glory? What if this was the year of the catastrophe? J.R. Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings, came up with this word. He made up a new word, eucatastrophe. E-U is the Greek word um, good. And so he just attaches it as a prefix. It's a prefix that means good. So it's a good catastrophe, kind of a happy accident. It became a literary term that's still talked about uh, today. And we see it in the best of stories. It's when the worst is happening, when the hero is in trouble, he is about to die. Everything's dark. And then something happens that flips it all around. You see it in the Lord of the Rings. If you know the story, when Gollum falls into the cracks of, of Mount Doom and the one ring is destroyed. You see it when the, when the Death Star, you know, explodes in Star Wars. You see it in, uh, gosh, um, Snow White, you know, when she's kissed, right? And then she's brought back to life or revived or something. You see it when Gaston stabs the beast and he dies, he's laid out and Bell comes and sure enough, finally he has true love and he comes back to life, literally a new man. All of these stories are eucatastrophes and they reflect or they're shadows of the greatest eucatastrophe of all time. If you're tracking with me, we're here in church, right? Um, and Tolkien himself, who's a Christian, said the greatest eucatastrophe was cr the Christ event. It was Christ's life and, yes, his death and his resurrection, the darkest day in history. But prior to that, there was another dark day, and we find it in uh, Genesis 3. And today we're going to see how God twists and spins everything around. Only a sovereign God can do this. Because we might see the eucatastrophe of the cross and, and redemption. It's our story, right? We understand it as the meta-narrative of life. 
It's the mega story. But we don't often let that story, which is a backdrop of everything we believe as Christians, we don't often look at everyday life that way. We often look at the tragedy and we don't see what God is doing in it. Or we don't think it can be redeemed. Or even, here's, here's a sovereign God, even mistakes we make, how can he actually redeem those things that we've done or challenges around us? Let me ask you, have you ever had a catastrophe in your life? Have you ever seen the darkest, worst things that could happen? Maybe a moment or something you had to go through. I talked earlier to someone who had walked through illness, through cancer, and just got a clean bill of health. And all the things that she had been learning, you know, I'm certain, through it all to get to where they are. Now, some things we talked about last week, some things just stink. But we have to trust God that he's at work always. I talked to another member just this morning who said, hey, you know, I've been unemployed for the past two months. And uh, pray for me. I, got, I, I think I've got a new job. I'm, I'm talking with him tomorrow. It's going to be a story completely flipped around. And he's believing it. That it's happening. That God is redeeming all things. We all have a story like that. Perhaps. But today we're going to see how God makes it happen so that it can happen in our, day, in our daily life. And we're going to see it in Genesis 3. And we're going to start with verse 14 through 21. We're going to see three things. All right. If you uh, take notes on sermons and soon when you get your journal... You can carry it along with you um, and you can write in it daily. I have mine already and, and uh, you can also bring it and take notes on sermons. It'd be a great resource for you to hang on to with your Bible. All right. So um, before we get there, though, I want you to see three things that God promises to redeem. The first is he promises to redeem our conflicts. He promises to redeem our pain. This is wild. And he promises to redeem our struggles. So first, he promises to redeem our conflicts. You don't have to raise hands because this might be really close, really tender. How many of you have gone through some conflicts right now? And it's likely with other people. God redeems all of our conflicts. And we're going to see how he does this and how you can apply this portion of the message to your life. Now, we all know the story. Okay, so before we get to verse 14... Um, we all know the story. God puts a tree in the garden. Uh, it's, a gar it's the tree of life. Uh, you eat from it. He says, eat from all the trees. That's life, flourishing, intimacy with God. They have this perfect relationship with God. But on the way to the tree of life, there's this tree of good and bad. The tree of good and evil is the tree that represents taking the authority, watch this, and deciding on our own what is good and bad, all right? In our own eyes, what is good and what is bad, usurping God's authority to do that and, and elevating our own take on what's good and bad. And when humans do that, we, we all know this, uh, it, it leads to broken relationships, conflicts. It leads to death, ultimately, in some form. And this is what we see here. Now, uh, they, of course, Adam and Eve, um, don't obey God. And so then in their shame and their disobedience, they try to cover themselves up uh, in their nakedness. They realize, how about that? They are shameful and they attempt to hide from God using fig leaves. OK, God shows up and he's asking questions. He interrogates them. First question is, where are you? As if he doesn't know. He wants Adam to say, well, I'm right here. And why are you hiding? And then he says, have you eaten? Of course, God knows. Have you eaten? eaten from the tree I told you not to eat from. And the man then, then you start the blame game. You probably know this story. It's a well-known story. Um, he says this. He says, well, the woman you gave me. Not only blaming the woman, he's blaming God. We do the same, don't we? Well, if this hadn't happened, if that person hadn't been in, if that, we do this all the time. And if we're really honest, we could think through some of the conflicts we're facing even now, and we could, we could own it. We'll talk a little bit about that. But God steps in and he's asking these questions because he wants him to realize what he's done. And then it goes from Adam to Eve. And then we see the serpent in verse 14. Here it is. Now, this, similar, this story is so uh, familiar to us that it's possible to miss the most important thing in it all. Everything is driven, don't miss this, by God, by speech. Every action is driven by God's speech in particular. He's created the world from his word, you could say. God's word drives everything in this entire story. So look at what it says in verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, 
This is the first curse, okay, following the now consequences of sin. Because you, and notice he goes first to, this, to Satan, comes first to, to the evil one. Because you have done this, cursed or cursed are you above all, okay, underline that, livestock and above all the beasts of the field, on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity, this word means personal hostility, between you and the woman and between your offspring, whatever that might be, think about that, which ultimately it's going to be, okay, evil in the world, um, sin, death, all of those things. That's the offspring of Satan and her offspring. And the word their offspring is the word seed, by the way. Um, some have noted it's singular. Uh, could it be plural? He, now it says he, he shall bruise your head. And you shall bruise his heel. Now, there's a lot going on here. Um, and before we get lost in all the questions that come around this passage, I want you to notice again, pri the primary action here is, is driven by God's word. What he says is what is final. He sets forth his word. He, he says, here's, here's what's right and wrong. Obey this and don't, don't do this. He, um, he establishes consequences for sin. Now we see curses. We're going to see um, not only consequences, but blessings, promises to come, okay? Covenants that he will make because he's the one driving everything. Don't miss this, friends. You might go, Jeff, I know this, I know this, but do you really live this way? God is in control. His word is absolute. His word is final. It is definitive, and it is how we are to live our lives. How relevant is Genesis 3? Everything recalibrates back to Genesis 3 and what we see in creation. All of life comes back to Genesis and it's all set up there. How critical is this in our cultural moment? Because every problem that we see, all the confusion in our culture is because we have said, nah, I know that you said that, but I'm going to take it myself and I will eat of what I think is right and wrong. I'll determine my identity. I'll determine my preferences of how I want to live regardless of what you've said. And we've noted that if we do that, I'll determine my purpose. I'll be the one to decide what my life's about. Even life after death, I'll decide all those things. That is a life not only that's filled with anxiety and confusion, but it's a life that ultimately leads to meaninglessness and a life without purpose. And so as we understand God's word and decide, I'm going to follow his word as hard as that is to do. His word brings clarity. You see that? His word makes it real clear for us. The problem is we don't want to follow it. Confusion abounds. And, and sin and ultimately things that lead to death and not flourishing. So here it is again. I'm going to keep saying it. If God speaks to us through his word, wouldn't you be in it daily? Wouldn't you like be in it all the time? And I've said it recently. If you want to hear God's voice, read his word. If you want to hear him speak audibly, read it out loud. Get into his word. And friends, before you leave today, if they're still left, we'll have these available down in the commons. Grab one of these, just a tool to help you to, to write in it and to say, how is God speaking to me? What am I going to do here? You know, what, what, who will I tell? And you'll be able to, to really look at what God's telling you and, and think about it. Journaling is such a powerful way to do that. Um, and, and so I want you to dive in to, to dwell, okay? There's a few habits that you can establish this year that will change your life. One is to read God's word daily. To get clarity on what he's saying to you. And, and, and I get it. It's like a meal. Some meals are better than others. Sometimes you'll sit and go, I, I, I don't know. I, I, didn't, I didn't catch a whole lot there. I'm not sure what happened. But listen, it's in prayer then. Lord, speak to me. And write down what he's saying to you. Write down what you want to say to him. And, and every single day you do that, it'll change the course of your life this year. Another habit is to be in worship every single week. Now, again, you'd expect that <laughs> from your pastor, but I'm telling you, you are here, you've, you've chosen wisely today. You're going to hear some things that you're going to be able to apply. It's going to set the week for you. Be here every single week, and another pattern in your life is to do it with others. And if you're not in a connect group here in our context, you can get in a group and, and dive into the word regularly with others and be, be accountable, be served, and serve others. This is how we do it together. There's more than just that. 
But I want to encourage you with this too, all right? Little, little, little promo. Um, we start our Grow, um, all the opportunities and offerings this coming Wednesday night. One of those is the pastor's study, we've called it. And it's where I'm gathering with, with anyone that wants to come on Wednesday nights. We're going to be in the loft uh, this semester, which is right above me here, 615 starting this Wednesday. And everyone's welcome to come. If you want to dive into how do you read God's word, we use dwell as a springboard to learn more, even dive deeper into some questions. If you're not in a connect group because you're serving on Sunday morning, you just hadn't found one, it's a great place. You can join us there. Um, but we just dive in and talk about resources that are available. How can you understand a text like this? How can you, how do you do this? We call it the pastor study because um, you get inside my head and, and how me and others on our team, how do you read God's word? And that's what we talk about. Okay, so. Back to the text. Notice the first, again, first thing that God does. He puts Satan in his place. These are not, this is not a battle between two, um, two equals. Not by a long shot. And so what I want you to see, as Adam and Eve represent all of us, okay, what's happening here with this, this now curious, um, mysterious serpent, we don't know what he looked like beforehand. We don't really know what he looked like exactly. He's like, he looked like a snake. He's on his belly. We don't know what he looked like beforehand, but there's something deeper going on here, as is the entire story here. The interrogation with Adam, then Eve, then it ends with, with Satan. And God doesn't, uh, he doesn't dialogue with him. He's got nothing but what he wants to say to him. He don't want to hear from him. Because he's going to put Satan in his place. God is not interested in what Satan has to say. Because <laughs> he knows. Comparatively, he is insignificant. And now, the physical nature of this creature matches the place in, his place in created order. He is low. He is insignificant. He cannot go everywhere he wants to go. This is significant to understand the nature of Satan. Satan's place is one of humiliation. He's constantly covered, breathing in the dust of death and of all the victims that have been his. And he is in a place of humiliation. This, this whole story to this point teaches us a few things about conflicts. First of all, the conflicts that you're in are a part of a larger struggle. Again, everything makes sense. I've been to places around the world, not here in the global West as so, so much. We're so sophisticated we're so educated that we have um, now characterized Satan as, you know, well, he's like in this little pitchfork. He's got his, he's got his red suit on. And we have so car cartooned him that we don't even believe in him. We don't take him into account. I've been to places all over the world where they go, no, there's evil. <laughs> and there's Satan. And it's why it makes sense of everything going on in the world. See, how is it that, that there's, a, there's a seemingly meaningless war going on in Ukraine? right now. Evil. How is it that Hamas attacks Israel? Israel responds. People are still dying. What is going on? Evil. Why is it that there have been more mass shootings in 2024 than there have been days? Evil. Why is it that I struggle in my own life? Why am I always facing challenges and struggles? Why do I have this attitude? Why can't I get along with it? Evil. Everything goes back to sin. And what we see here is that all of it starts within us. Now, this is important to note. We don't have time to dive into James 4, 1 and 2. If you want to mark this, James 4, 1 and 2 prompts us to look deeply, introspectively into our own hearts. He asks the question, why are there conflicts among you to believers? And then he answers the question, because there's conflicts within you. And then he explains it this way. So profound is this, is this perspective. He says, there's conflicts within you because someone is not giving you what you want. That's what it is. Think about whatever conflict you're wrestling with right now. It's because somebody is not following your lead, what you want. You're playing God. I'll decide what's good and bad here. And if you don't come through for me and give me what I want, I'm in trouble. No, you're in trouble. And I'm going to hold it against you. See, everything starts from within. Now, the second thing we need to see here thus far is that the war is already won. 
Now you might say, now some of you know this text, you're like, well, wait, where, where is that? Where is that in all this? This personal hostility, the seed that will come. Again, the singular seed, and then he is Jesus. It's already in this covenant, in the mix of the fall, is this rising up of hope that will come. This is the proto-gospel. And he might nip at, uh, at Jesus' heel, and in fact, you know, it will be fatal to some degree, but he's going to crush the serpent's head. But some scholars have noted this word, yes, offspring, and you're kind of catching it, aren't you? That the word seed, no, is that one person or multiple people? Yeah, yes, and yes. It's singular and multiplied. Now, this is important because the ambiguity brings even more power to the word. Because yes, Jesus has crushed evil on the cross. He took it all upon himself. He dies on the cross. The victory then is ours. This is a powerful Hebrew word. This word seed is is powerful, huge word in the covenants of God. We see it throughout scripture because it's singular and multiplied so that each of us, watch this, every time we're tempted by the evil one, by our own desires given over, we instead obey God and we say no in a real sense. We are crushing his head all over again and we have power over him because of Christ in us. We now have the spirit in us. And this crushing of Satan, defeating him, is, 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 is what happens in our lives as we follow him. So the conflict between the seed and the serpent, you see, is, is that the seed of the woman, right, is by which, is the means by which salvation will come. The eucatastrophe is that the victory has been won. But why is it that we can keep on fighting the battle? Well, Satan is is still at work. He's trying to inflict as much pain as, as possible. Um, you know, some, you could get into all kinds of questions around that. Is, is, if, if we can't, you know, is, is, does there have to be evil in order to choose good? Um, how, how, why didn't God create a world where there's no evil? I would say, well, that, that would be heaven. Um, we can choose to love him, choose not to love him. And this is the perfect world that he's created. But the conflict continues. But here's another reason the conflict continues within us. Not just while well, Satan's still alive and he's trying to take us all down before he's ultimately put away uh, forever. But secondly, some of us don't believe that the battle has been won. We don't live like, it's, like we've won. Or how about this? We fight spiritual battles with worldly weapons. We're seeing a lot of that in these days. We'll have a conflict with someone in, in our personal lives. And we'll come back with the worldly, you know, chat. Well, okay, you come at me like that. I'm coming at you like this. And we see this in spades in, in our culture where it seems that a lot of Christians believe that the way that we're going to hold on to Christian virtue in our country is by setting Christian virtue aside. Not following the way of Jesus. Not, not applying and living out the fruit of the Spirit. No, let's set that aside because we've got a greater agenda here No, that is the agenda. The agenda is to live like Jesus and to have faith to believe that's how we're going to change the world is by living like him. And this is what happens in the believer's life. You see, the fruit of the spirit changes everything. We defeat evil by being like Jesus. As we'll see, he absorbs evil, death, sin by dying to himself. And the eucatastrophe takes place and we see everything changes. So another application here is, of course, you need to know God's word. Okay, with all the conflicts that we face, what about the struggles, the results of our own sin? God redeems our pain. Clearly, there are consequences for sin. Don't miss that. But again, the late, great uh, Tim Keller noted that the covenants of God is where we see an intersection of law and love. Now, think, think with me here. We don't like the consequences. We're like, and some people think, man, God's just up there. You know, he's just kind of slapping us around and he knew we're going to sin. Where's the love in that? Watch this. Where's the law in a relationship that says, let's say you have a covenant relationship. And the closest thing we have still in our culture today is marriage. Not in all circles, but still marriage is a covenant. Covenant says I'm in whether you're in or not. A contract says you do your part. If you do, I'm in. If you don't keep your part, I am out. That's a contract. Covenant says I'm in. 
I mean, regardless of what you do. The covenants of God are the same way. But look at this. It's this, it's this dynamic mix of law and love. If you were to say in marriage, for instance, okay, legally binding, here's the law, you know, you need to, let's be committed to one another. And then someone goes off, there's infidelity in the marriage, all right? Uh, don't, you don't hold to your promise. If you were to say, ah, no big deal, that's not a big deal. That's neither law nor love. You see how that works? Law actually elevates the commitment. So God says, okay, here's how this works. You're going to follow me because my commands are for your good. I've created you out of love. But here's what happens in relationships. We find ourselves, um, and we see it here. You see the word desire? Sin and desire are so closely related. Because what happens, there's this brokenness in relationships. Look at, look at verse 16. Let's go ahead there. Verse 16, it says, to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain. There it is. In childbearing, in pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Now, first, make note, the ruling over is after the fall. All right. Because here's what happens. You see how closely desire, here's that word, desire and sin are closely related. And this word desire is not romantic love. It's a desire to consume. It's a desire to power up. It's a desire for, um, for, to, be, to, to really use up. You get a sense of, of consuming. It's to have a person's total being devoured by your own. Like wanting your way. Here's what happens in marriage. Every conflict, this is true in, in all relationships. Every conflict is that we, sin has called us to shift from responsibilities to rights. And that's where we go. We run, what is my right? What do I get out of this? You see, it's all pride and self-centered. But how does God, in the midst of all this, redeem our pain? Part of what we see here, the, again, there's, there's something deeper going on. What's up with this childbirth thing and painful and childbirth, all, all the things. Some have noted it's not just labor. Now, you could argue that's temporary. Um, and epidural does wonders these days. But, uh, but still, uh, no man in here knows what's up um, regarding that. But there's greater pain here to give birth to uh, a child and rear them in, in a fallen world. It's a child born into sin. And we all know this. You don't need to teach a preschooler, you know, uh, sin. Like, you don't need to teach them how to say no. Um, all of us are born with this. And so the greater pain is, is, is that. But how does God redeem our pain? Pain is one of the great gifts. And I know you know this. You've heard it. We talk about it. Pain is one of the great gifts that draws us closer to God. And sometimes we can't always see that, but we've got to believe he's working in it, even in those moments. I could argue there's no such thing in the kingdom of God. There's no such thing as gratuitous pain and suffering. Meaningless pain. Though it might seem that way sometimes, God is at work. He uses pain as a tool to draw us closer to him. Now, catch this. Pain is rightly introduced into the world because it's a consequence of the fall. Pain is felt because something is wounded. Pain is felt because something is dying. You see that? And this is what God said would happen. Pain is the natural consequence of the fall because it leads to death. But the eucatastrophe, God's grace, by his grace, he redeems our pain. How? I will not let you suffer without meaning. I will not let you go through pain and struggles. And, 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 and we know this in the end. We've said it recently. Everything that is sad will become untrue. And he will redeem all things. So the eucatastrophe, this is wild. The eucatastrophe is that through the pain of childbirth, the Savior is born. We just celebrated Christmas time. And life is given to all people. Look at this. It is through this pain, our sin and our lives have brought about this pain. And yet... Out of that comes salvation for all. Look at verse 20. Jump to verse 20. The man called his wife, his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all. I jump there because Adam goes from blaming Eve to honoring Eve. Now he's saying, from you, and do I need to say it? 
Every person here was born from a woman. And he's saying that it's from the woman every person will be born and ultimately the Savior will come. This is a statement of faith that he's making here. He's believing that she will give birth and it will be the seed of salvation that will come from her. So if you trust in God's promises, he redeems your conflicts. He redeems your pain in all things. And he just gives this as an example. But now I'll close with this. He redeems our struggles. He redeems our struggles. See, the longest, most detailed curse comes to Adam because he's ultimately responsible. Look at, look at this in verse 17. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because, you, because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you and you shall eat the plants of the field. Now, there's again a lot more going on here. Watch this. He curses the ground. Why? Because it's from the ground that Adam came. And it's from the ground that the fruit came. The, 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 the fruit that ultimately ended up with death. Thorns and thistles are brought about by the earth naturally. Okay, now. And when Adam had plants that he did nothing to get but a free gift of God by grace, he, he, he abused it. But now he's going to have to work and he's going to appreciate the hard work of the fruit that he can still bring. Which is why hard work is a curse and a blessing. Because redeemed work can do good for others, right? Look at verse 19. For the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. And out of it you were taken for your dust and to dust you shall return. Now this return to dust, return to the ground is a pronouncement of death on humanity is what this is. Adam's dust and instead of thriving in this eternal relationship with God, he's now going to die. But redeemed, you see, our, our struggles with work and toil can produce good fruit and good things even still. Verse 21, it closes this way. And the Lord God made for Adam and his, his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Look at what a gracious act this is. Do you see it? After all that. The punishment, the consequences, the curses, all the things. God says, okay, I'm, I'm here. I'm still here for you. Notice God gives the coverings. And this, they are clothed by the first blood sacrifice. Animals die. And the great eucatastrophe is, of course, that Christ comes as the ultimate lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world and he would take away our sin and the curse that was wrought because of a desired fruit hanging on a tree now is ended by one who's undesired who hangs on a tree. And the eucatastrophe takes place. The perfect man, Paul calls him the second Adam, who could not do what the first Adam did. He comes and he lives perfectly. He's in perfect community. Uh, intimacy and, and follows the commands of God for us as our substitute. He's the second Adam. He's the perfect Israel who is doing and accomplishes what Israel could never accomplish through the covenant. Jesus fulfills the covenant and he takes on himself, again, all that the fall has wrought. Sin, death, hell. He lays down his life at its mercy, he absorbs it all onto himself. He dies for us. So that then he says this, and listen to these verses. Ephesians 4, 24, it says this. So put on, all right, be clothed with the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And then in 1 Corinthians, and because of him, you who are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. There's the word. I asked you earlier, how many of you have ever experienced a catastrophe? If you're in Christ, let me ask you again. How many of you have ever experienced a catastrophe? Every one of us who are in Christ have experienced the greatest 
you catastrophe. And then he goes on to say this. If this is true, this is our confession. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. Hold on to the promises for he who promised is faithful. He's redeeming everything in your life. All of your conflicts, all of your pain, all your struggles. And it says in 2 Corinthians 1, for all the promises of God. Let's say this together. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. Praise be to God for the great catastrophe that's taking place. And then in Revelation, it says that someday we're going to stand before God on the new earth, before our, new, uh, the, our, our renewed bodies, the resurrected bodies, worship and a resurrected Savior. And it says we're going to be covered in robes, in white robes. I don't know if that's for real or if simply saying, no, you're going to be totally forgiven, completely redeemed. That's what it is. The day is coming. And we're going to be able to worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay? So what we're going to do, we're going to take of the Lord's Supper together. And I want to pray before we, uh, some of our servants among us are going to serve you. And uh, we're going to have to sing a song together before we go. A proclamation of faith. Some of us need to say it out loud and sing it out loud. The Lord is my salvation. And everything that is needed to be accomplished for me has been accomplished. And we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper that he's called us to. The great way to start the new year on this day as we begin a wonderful year before him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the way that you have redeemed us in ways we could never dream. In fact, for some of us here today, it seems so good. It's hard to believe. But you're God. And you do what you want to and you do it in a way we never expect. And so... Friend, I'd ask you the question, even before we partake, do you know him? Have you received his grace as the greatest twist, the greatest turn in your life? And if you haven't, today is the day. Right now to say yes to him. Because all the promises of God are, are yes in him. And if you know him, praise him, thank him for his sacrifice. Say, Lord, I believe. And all of us, Lord, help me with my unbelief that I would hold fast to the confession. So, Lord, we commit our lives to you. We give you our, our lives anew as we begin this year with all that it holds before us and all that is unseen. We say yes to you.